So we're going to get started now with our next lesson, lesson 9-3, day 2. And we're going to keep talking about uh, some two-way tables here. And we're going to continue to explore uh, if there's an association between two things. In other words, is there a relationship between two things? Is one group more likely to do something than everybody else? And the example I gave yesterday in our last lesson was... Um, if, uh, for example, if you exercise, are you going to be healthier? Does, does exercising make you healthier? And then you can look at how many people are generally are healthy. And then you can look at how many people that exercise are healthy. And you can use those percentages to decide is, is there really an association or a relationship between exercising and being healthy? So uh, sometimes there is and sometimes there isn't a relationship. So let's take a look at this two-way table here. And decide, our question is, is we're going to find out, is there an association between a student knowing a cell phone, uh, <laughs> a student owning a cell phone, and being late for school? So does owning a cell phone make you late for school? That's what they mean by, is there an association between owning a cell phone and being late for school? So like we talked about in our last lesson, the first thing you have to do is you have to find the percent of everyone that is normally late for school. So that one, so remember this, first thing I do is I look at the totals. I just look at totals, right? I just look at the totals. So, so nice writing there. Okay, so looking at the totals, we're going to look at everyone that's late. So here's late. All the people that are late was 30 from this sample data, right? Out of... 300. So 30 out of 300, if you take your calculators and you need to divide those two, I can see this as one extra zero, so I know it's 10%. Okay, But you go 30 divided by 300, you get 0.3, move the decimal, uh, excuse me, 0.1, move the decimal one time, you get 10%. Okay, so find the percent of everybody. Now we're going to just look at the cell phone owners. Okay, so we go over here and we look at cell phones. So all the people that own cell phones, there's 220 of them. And how many of those people are late? Of those people are late. Now, you couldn't use 30 this time, guys, because they're saying, does owning a cell phone, so your total has to come from cell phone, not from late. Okay? All right. That's the trickiest part, deciding do I use the 220 or the 30. That's the hardest part here. And you, you learn that from, from reading the problem. So of all the cell phone owners, so I go total for cell phone, not total for late. So I got 220. And how many of those guys are late? 22. And again, when you divide those two with your calculators, you can check that. Pause the video and check that. But you should get 10%. And so what we noticed here is that the uh, relative frequency for um, everybody is 10%. Right? The conditional relative frequency of just the people that own cell phones, 10% of them were also late. So it doesn't matter if you own a cell phone or not. It's the same amount of, uh, same percentage of people that are late either way. So you could say in this case, when we have the same percents from doing, after doing this, then you would say, no, there's no association. There's no relationship. In other words, owning a cell phone doesn't make you more late than everybody else. All right, here's another uh um, two-way table, and we're going to <clears throat> decide there's, now look at the word I used this time. I've said this before, but I haven't written it down. Is there a relationship? And we decide if there's a relationship, same way decide if there's an association. So I'll read the question first. So a relationship between what? Being a boy and liking classical music. So in other words, are boys more likely to like classical music than girls? That's what they mean. Is there a relationship or is there an association between those two? So first of all, we have to figure out what's the percentage of people, all people, that like classical music. So if we go to classical right here, and the total is 5 out of the total total. 5 out of 100 is 5 hundredths or 0 0.05, right? Or 5%. You could, again, take your calculator and divide those two and get a decimal move the decimal two times to get your percent or if you read it it's five over 100 that's five literally five hundredths like this which would be five percent 
right? Percents move the decimal two times. Do you get percent from decimal? Some review there. So that's out of everybody. Now we have to look at just the boys. Is there a relationship between being a boy and liking classical music? So what I have to do then is I have to get specific now. I have to look at the condition that what if it's a boy this time? Well, there's a total of 40 boys. Don't use this total again. And two of those boys like classical music. So I have a fraction of 2 40ths. And if you took your calculators and divided that, you would see that, again, you would get 5%. So what does that mean? Is there a relationship? Well, since they have the same percentages, or even if it was very close to the same, you would say, no, there's no relationship. So you're not going to like classical music more just because you're a boy. Being a boy or a girl has nothing to do with classical music. It's all personal taste. Your, your gender doesn't affect that preference. All right, so there's no association, or another way to say it, we just learned is no relationship between the two. Here's another two-way table. <clears throat> and we're going to decide using the different uh, word relationship as opposed to association this time. Is there a relationship between owning a bike and being on time? Well, we have to check everybody that's what first. Everybody that's on time. You guys do that. Pause the video right now and find the percent of people that are normally at on time from the total category. Do that now. So the total people that are on time, we've got to go to on time. On time's right here. Everybody that's on time from this, uh, this poll is 73. Out of the total ask is 100, and you know out of 100 is the definition of percent, so we didn't even need to use our calculator. We know that means 73%. So normally, 73% of people are on time. Now, we're going to see if owning a bike changes that. Are these guys more likely to be on time? So since we're talking about owning a bike, our condition is, do you own a bike now? So we'll check this conditional relative frequency here. We'll look at the people that just own a bike, and of those people... The total is not 100 now. Only 20 people own a bike. And of those 20, 17 were on time. And if you took your calculator and did 17 divided by 20, okay, I think you would get, like, that's just like a quiz as we usually take, right, out of 20 points, the test, the weekly test. And each test is 5%. So can you do that in your head real quick? I think that should be around about, what, 85%? Okay. So, you, again, you can just check with your calculator. If what I said doesn't make sense, you go 17 divided by 20, get your decimal, move the decimal two times to see that it's 85%. So normally, 75% of people on time out of everybody, including whether you have a bike or not. But if you just look at the people that own a bike, just that specific little group, 85% of those people are on time. So if you just look at the, the bike owners, they're on time more often than the total group. So if it's more, more likely that you're going to be on time by owning a bike, then what that means is there is a relationship between owning a bike and being on time, at least from this poll, right, from this group of people wherever they live. All right, so you see how that works? The percents are the same, no association, no relationship. If the percents are different, there's a relationship, there's an association. All right, let's study those for our next test. Let's go ahead and start our review section. Go ahead and pause the video now and do this problem. So I know that anything to the zero power is one, so I cross out my one and know that three doesn't become a one. If I had three n in parentheses to the zero, then the whole thing would be one, but only the n is to the zero, the three is not. That's three to the first times into the zero. I know that when I have a negative exponent, that means to flip it. So then once I flip it, I get a positive exponent. So this simplified would equal three over n to the third. Pause the video now, try the next problem. All right, so solving this equation here, we're going to uh, convert everything into a fraction first. Whoops, my pad's acting up here. So I'm going to multiply 18 times 2 is 36, and then add that 17. Yes, it's fine just to whip out your calculator. You're going to get 53 either way. So I got 53 eighteenths is the same number as 2 and 17 eighteenths. Now we're going to convert 4 and, 1, 4 and 3 fourths right here. So I'm going to convert that. I get 7 fourths. And I, 
whoops, let me, sorry, let me fix this here. Okay, I have one fourth n, that's already a fraction, no need to change that. Let me separate my left from my right side of my equation. All right, I'm going to isolate the n. I work farthest away from the variable first. The opposite of a positive 7 fourths is to subtract 7 fourths. Now, we can't add fractions together that aren't the same size pieces. That bottom number of a fraction is how big the pieces are. So we got to make those pieces the same, but they still have to be the same fraction. So how do we do that? If I multiply something times 1, it doesn't change, right? So how do I, I got to, whatever I multiply this by, I have to do it to the top and the bottom. Because if I have the same number on top and bottom, that's one, right? Two over two is one. Three over three is one. Four over four is one. So I got to figure out what do I multiply by so that 18 and four are the same. So I just am getting a lowest common denominator, same bottom number before I can add these two. I look at the multiples of 18 and I can keep going. And I look at the multiples of four and I can keep going. But eventually I'm going to see that they both go into 36. And they'll both go into... 72 and, and other numbers and so on and so forth. But we want to use the first one. That's called lowest common denominator. So I can't add these two until I have a lowest common denominator. I have to change these fractions, but have them be the same amount. So in order, in order for this to be 36, I got to multiply it by 2, but I also got to do it to the top. Because if I do it to the top and the bottom, then this new fraction over here, this new fraction right here, is 106 36. And all I did is 2 times 53, right? And 2 times 18. Down here, there's a negative up top. Okay. Negative up top over there. And we have, what do I multiply this by? Well, 9 times 4 is 36. Remember, I'm, I'm trying to get them so that they're the same size pieces, which is 36. So I go 9 over 9, because if I do it to the top and the bottom, it's the same fraction. Even though it looks different, it's the same exact fraction. Just one is simplified, the other is not. Now I can add these two. Now that I have the same size pieces, same denominator, same bottom number, I copy that bottom number. That's how big the pieces are, but I have to add the numerators. That's how many of the pieces I have. I have 106 of those 36 and a negative 63 of those 36. And when they're opposite teams, and I'm adding, I subtract, right? Positives. And negatives get subtracted from each other. So I take those two away. You can go out to the side. Or if you want to just grab the calculator, no big deal. I go 1 over 6 minus 63. And I get a difference of 43. But there are more positives than negatives this time. So that's why it's going to be a positive 43, 36. Now I'm going to isolate the variable by getting rid of the coefficient, the number in front of the variable. Whenever I have a fraction in front, I can simply get rid of that by multiplying both sides by the reciprocal of that fraction. So if I flip 1 over 4 upside down, this is what I do when there's a fraction in front of a letter. I flip the number in front upside down, and I multiply both sides by that number. And that will make this go away. Because reciprocals or multiplicative inverses will cancel each other out. They'll become a 1. Over here, i got to cross-cancel, right? Do my factor trees, cross out my 1. 4 goes into 4 one time. 4 goes in uh, 36 9 times. So I have a reduced fraction of 40 third ninths. Now if I look at my answer, this answer over here is not more simplified than this answer. It's just converted. This process right here that I did right here is simplifying. But since they converted it, they wanted that. I'm going to check my answer by dividing in and out to see if they're the same. So... 9 goes into 43 at the most three times, right? Because 9 times 4 is, third is, oops, I'm sorry, <laughs> at the most four times. At the most four times. So I get 36, subtract these two. Okay. <clears throat> and then I subtract those two. Of course, I get 7. So 4 and 7 ninths, yep, this is the same answer. That's how we get it right. You guys pause the video and do this next problem. So I'm going to solve this two-step equation. I have some number divided by 5 and then subtract 7 will equal 15. And by solving, we're going to figure out what that number is. So I work farthest away from the variable first. Could have done your rule for subtraction first, right? Cross those out. What number divided by 5 is add these two is 22? Well. 
Inverse operation, well, this is division, right? What's the opposite of division? It's to multiply. So if I multiply both sides by 5, cross out my 1s, I get my answer. Answer is 110. I want you guys to go ahead and pause the video and do this next review problem. So we're solving a system of equations. We already have one of the variables isolated. We actually have another variable isolated too, but that doesn't matter. I just take this and plug it into the other equation where that variable goes. And I write this 5x plus 4 equals 7x plus 6. And I'm going to solve this multi-step equation. Simplify both sides first. That's done. Get your variables on the same side as step 2. Getting my variables on the same side, I use inverse operations. I take the x with it. I'm not dividing here. I'm adding or subtracting. 7x take away 5x means I have two x's left. Now I'm on step three, isolate the variable. So I work farthest away from the variable first. I do inverse or opposite operations. So the opposite of positive six is to subtract six. So I'm gonna subtract six from both sides, right? Subtract from the constant, not from the variable, right? I have more negatives and positives over here. So I get four and a negative six is negative two. Divide both sides by two, cross out your ones and you get your answer, x is uh, negative one. So I showed your answer a little bit soon there, right? Because we found the X, but this is a system. In other words, these two lines are going to hit somewhere. They're going to hit at a point X and Y. We found the X. We have to find the Y now. Now, this is just coincidence that this Y is negative one also. It's not always going to be that way, but you should have known that already. We have to find our Y. So what we do is we take our X, which we found is a negative one, and we plug it into either of these equations. So when I plug it back into any one of these equations to get my y, I'll see that coincidentally, this time it happens to be the same as the x. So the solution is negative 1, negative 1. You guys go ahead and pause the video and answer this question. So this review problem, again, we're finding equations for a line. I hope this is so easy for you in high school. You guys are going to breeze through Algebra 1. That's my goal for you guys next year. So how do we write an equation for a line? We need the slope, and we need the y-intercept. So we're going to get the y-intercept first. We're going to go y minus y over x minus x. Notice that sometimes, pay attention right here, sometimes we have to write two negatives, right? When, I, when do I have to write two negatives? Well, if I go x minus x, if there's another negative, I have to write 2. So add the opposite, add the opposite. Now I can use team, same team, add. Opposite team, subtract, who has more. We have a slope of negative 4 fourths, which can be simplified, I believe, to negative 1. Now we got to get the y-intercept. Unfortunately, I can't see a graph where it hits the y-axis to see it real quick. I can't see my shortcut. In other words, none of my x's are zero. So this is a situation where I have to find it. So I'll pick one point. It doesn't matter which point, but I'll usually pick the one with the smaller numbers. Try to avoid negatives if I can. Try to find fractions and decimals if I can. So I'll just pick, let's say, negative 1, negative 3. And the slope that I just found, which is negative 1. And I plug it into slope-intercept form. y, this is y, equals m, this is m, x, this is x, and plus b. Now, if I solve for b here, you will see that I can find where the line hits the y-axis at negative 4. So b is negative 4, m is negative 1. My equation has to be negative x minus 4. So let me show you that step before this. I go y equals mx plus b, I have to find m and b to get an equation for a line. So I put the m where the m goes. You found that, y minus y or x minus x. I put the b where the b goes. And when I simplify this, negative 1 times x is just negative x, and plus negative 4 is just minus 4. That's why this is the answer. You guys pause the video and try this next problem. So we have a string going straight down, uh, a string on a pole, a pole goes straight down. So this is 16, it reaches out five feet, and we have another Pythagorean theorem problem. So I have a squared plus b squared equals c squared, okay? 
And if you don't know 16 squared, maybe I don't know that off the top of my head either, just go ahead and go 16 times 16, 256, and then add 5 times 5, which is 25. Don't do 5 times 2, right? And we get 281 equals C squared. Now keep in mind, that's this area of this square. I need to know just this side, so I got to take the square root of both sides. And the square root of C squared of C, the square root of 281, well, we already have a calculator, so we can just hit square root, but I see that it's an irrational number. And if they want exact length, then I'll just leave it in the square root. And lastly, we're going to go ahead and solve this multi-step equation here. So you guys pause the video and try that now. All multi-step equations, doesn't matter what math class you're in, right? You want to simplify both sides, get the variable on the same side, and then isolate the variable. So I'll do my rule for subtraction there. Don't need to do it here, right? Because it's already an addition sign here. So I, how, how do I simplify both sides? I distribute first and then combine like terms. So let me distribute on this side. Negative 2 times 6m is negative 12m. And 2 times 1 is 2. Notice that's not a 1, it's a 2. You had to distribute that 2, right? Over here, nothing to distribute. There's nothing next to you. Next to means times. So this side is already simplified. There are no like terms to combine. You can't add m's to constants. You add m's to m's and constants to constants. Now that both sides are simplified, we want to get our variable on the same side. So I'll pick one of the m's. And in this step two, when I'm getting my variables on the same side, I take the m with it. I'm not dividing here. I'm adding or subtracting. I do the same thing to both sides, inverse operation. The opposite of negative 12m is positive 12. Here I do teams that are more positives than negatives left. And now I'm on step three, isolate. This is now a two-step equation, just like that fraction one we did earlier. So I start work farthest away from the variable, doing inverse operations. And 30 plus 2 is 32 equals 4m. The opposite of times is to divide. And 32 divided by 4 should be our solution of 8. Okay, so we will see you guys soon.